within a company, you've got all sorts of skills and capabilities, and you've got to, to embrace and, and harness all of them. So you, you've got some part of the scientific community that's fascinated by the molecule, fascinated by the technology. And then you've, you've got other parts of the organization that are really in touch with and close to and understanding the patient's mm -hmm. challenges and, and how the various diseases that we're addressing impact. And, and finding the overlap between where the cutting edge science um, impacts on the areas that we feel we can most effectively contribute on. And actually ensuring that our understanding of patient, uh, the disease process, the physiology, and actually what the patient just feels about living with a, with a particular um, indication is very helpful in, in informing us where we should go next. So, and wherever possible actually, because I think the pharmaceutical, one of the challenges of the pharmaceutical industry is we're not being terribly efficient. We've had too high failure rates, um, particularly when we have failure rates at late stages in clinical studies. It's very, very expensive. And it's perhaps avoidable in many instances if you understand the disease better. I think you understand the disease better by understanding the patient better and connecting the the science and the sort of molecular understanding of the disease in conjunction with the patient, but also understanding how that impacts the day-to-day -day life of a patient and indeed the families of, of a patient. So we've recognised that if unless we've got a better understanding of the likelihood of success of a particular mechanism, if we're just picking new mechanisms that might have potential application in disease, we either have to do that experiment really very early and get a clear cut yes or no answer before we've we made the major investments in late stage studies or we've actually had to we really have to gain ourselves some real confidence and this can come from genetics for example that this mechanism is really pertinent to diseases and, and we've got a great example of this I think in the area of bone where we identified a population of patients um, who were impacted by a, a very rare bone disease associated with, with just much more dense bone, but generally normal bones. Yeah. And through understanding the genetics um, of that population, we were able to identify one gene um, that, that appeared to be absolutely pivotal in regulating bone deposition, so the way our bones uh, build greater mass or, or maintain um, strength and, and mineral density. And by doing that, we so having understood that one gene can control uh, the bone deposition process to such an extent, it's it's a very sound hypothesis to work forward on, to then go and make a molecule which interacts with that gene. In this case, we're fortunate because the absence of the gene leads to, to very, very strong bones. Therefore, your, your drug mechanism can be there to, to essentially capture and take out that protein. So instead of it being absent through a genetic deletion, as it is in this population of patients, we can make a drug to remove it. But, but the hypothesis is that we can superimpose that phys physiology on top of a patient who has low bone, low bone density, so for example perhaps an older lady suffering from postmenopausal osteoporosis, and ideally we can then reintroduce bone deposition in that patient and, and help that patient to actually further grow back strength and, and quality of, of bone. And whilst this hypothesis is still being tested because we're still doing the later stage clinical studies, um, it's looking very encouraging indeed at the moment. I think um, any company that is arrogant enough to think that they have all the expertise um, that is required to optimally find new therapeutic solutions and understand the disease and understand how you most optimally might deliver that to the right patient population is probably um, wrong. Yeah. I, for even the very largest companies, there are such a huge number of fantastic brains out there that also want to try and bring some benefit to these populations of patients. But if you can find the, the most appropriate way to collaborate in a synergistic way, then I think that's 
that's the way we have to go forward. And I think, you know, the obvious examples of collaboration are collaborating with academic colleagues who, who, have, a, who have a terrific um, um, and a, extensive knowledge of fundamental biology and also will, in many cases, have a great understanding of the clinical um, translatability of that target. I mean, it's, a, it's an oversimplification to say that the pharmaceutical industry provides great drug hunting, drug discovery, drug development skills and, and collaborating with academics to provide great fundamental biology because actually there are circumstances where academic groups do great drug discovery and there are circumstances where industry groups do great fundamental biological um, exploration. But generally I think those are areas where well, they certainly synergize. Of course, the collaborations can be in, in multi dimensions, and I think you mentioned IMI and, and Rob's yeah. involvement in IMI. That that tends to focus on what we call pre competitive okay. collaborations, which we also which are, are an important part of ensuring that we are we put ourselves collectively in a position to to better understand disease and better understand how we would be able to to, to identify new treatments. I think a great example of the sort of project um, that is ideal for an IMI is what we call a taxonomy project and, and this is a project that uh, UCP is very much involved with and is well supported um, in, in the IMI process. And here what we're trying to do is add a new level of understanding of the classification of disease. So. Um, Essentially, much of the classification of disease that we use at the moment was determined almost anatomically in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. But over and, and clearly, that remains a tremendously important way of understanding disease and classifying disease and understanding which which forms of disease might respond to one treatment or another or the likelihood of progression. But to complement that, the, the modern techniques of molecular biology and genetics and proteomics allow us the opportunity to superimpose on top of that another classification of diseases which are really very much more uh, based around the molecular processes that drive the disease. And there may be molecular processes in, I mean this is a good example I think is, not maybe, there are molecular processes in oncology which dr drive tumours that um, present themselves in different anatomical locations but fundamental um, alteration in the cell can, can be very common across across different a anatomical presentations. So if we can add to our current medical understanding of, of how you might classify a group of patients which outwardly present in a similar way, let's say in rheumatoid arthritis or in lupus, but we actually know that there's a significant heterogeneity underlying that external presentation. By understanding that heterogeneity and helping us understand which groups live more clearly, um, which molecular groups live more clearly together, we will probably be able to trial our drugs more effectively because we may be able to predict which subgroups are more um, likely to respond to the new mechanism that we're trying in a new treatment. It's not an exact science, and sometimes it's a bit of judgment, but I think you have to have some guiding principles. So you have to decide what your area of focus is, and, and our area of focus, as I mentioned, is in neurological and autoimmune inflammatory diseases. You have to decide what you think you might be able to contribute. Where, where could you go into a collaboration genuinely believing you were contributing something that was really useful? What, what do you believe if you, if the expertise you as a company are able to bring um, requires some additional skills, either to get to the fundamental understanding that puts ourselves in a position to discover new drugs or indeed to discover the new drugs. Can you identify what you think that missing ingredient or missing ingredients are and who do you think are the, the best players in the world that, that bring that? Those are the sort of processes that go into thinking about how to collaborate. So it's 
what do you want to do? Um, what do you think you, you can contribute um, in, in the, the various pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that are required? And, and what are the missing pieces? And who are the other, other potential partners who, are, who have a similar interest? Because I think that you need to find partners who want to achieve the same thing, but also would bring complementary skills. Well, both are very supportive and, and both are very good environments to do research and development in. They're slightly different. Uh, as I mentioned, the UK benefits from having probably more firepower, larger number of universities that really are at the cutting edge. But again, as I said, I, you know, I'd like to stress that we have some great universities that we collaborate with in Belgium. But as I say, there's probably more in the UK. It's very convenient, for, for at least from the immunology perspective here in the UK that we're doing. I think we also benefit in both cases from a sort of government environment that, that has a strong ambition to support and, and is appreciative, I think, of what we're attempting to do and the, the benefit to society from having you know, quality pharmaceutical R&D in, in a country because hopefully it, it brings benefit to, to patients. It also brings um, benefit through collaborating and ensuring that we have um, doctors who are really at the cutting edge of what new therapies might be, might even bring patients in one's country access to these new medicines when they're at the exploratory, exploratory stage. And, and also, of course, it brings um, very significant employment. So I think we do have um, an engagement and appreciation. I think in Belgium, what we have found is that um, in terms of direct financial support, um, Belgium to be more supportive of what we're, we're attempting to do than we find in the UK. UK support, although very significant, tends to be in a form that uh, goes to academic partners rather than certainly directly to any company of our size. I think it's more focused or directed towards small companies, small biotech. And I could understand the reason for that. I mean, I, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I think um, I understand why that might be. But I, I think we find ourselves able to access more collaborative um, government investment support in Belgium. I, I would like to start off by saying that UCB our intention is to continue to invest in the UK, but that will that will be based upon results. And I think whilst the UK, um, or, or particularly the, the the sites we have in the UK, continue to deliver um, cutting edge science and novel medicines, then I see every sign that you, the UCB supports very very strongly um, this the, this enterprise and will continue to invest in it, as I think is demonstrated by the proportion of our top line that is invested in a very, very high proportion of our top line uh, revenues are reinvested back in R&D and actually the bulk of our research is done in the UK. For UK as a whole and, and you know, by reference to other companies which may actually have um, reduced their investment in the UK, I think it's difficult to make a general comment about that. I think this is just a function of the pharmaceutical industry having to sharpen up and um, be, be much more cautious about where to invest mm -hmm. and where companies have not been successful, particularly if they failed in phase three with the huge costs. Unfortunately, that does often appear to bring some consequences and sometimes those consequences are most readily seen at the very early stage because perhaps if one doesn't take a long-term view um, that's an easy area to, to cut. So the objective there is to get a group of people together to, to understand how we can operate more effectively in the UK. And, and in doing so, perhaps we can also provide better clarity to government about what's really important and what would make a difference. And also we can, we can get together and decide how we can work together ourselves 
more effectively, work together with other partners like academic, um, um, clinical investigators, NIH, NHS, um, MRC. So understand and collaborate and, and have fora where we can actually get together and decide how we can. I, two examples of areas that we've focused on actually are the critical areas we've already talked about, one of them being clinical trials, because I think if we are successful in increasing, um, reversing the reduction of clinical trial activity in the UK, I really think it's good for everyone. It, it, it's good for um, the UK um, NHS because we're ensuring that we are helping doctors in the NHS be at the cutting edge of novel drug understanding and drug development. There's a financial benefit because actually these studies cost an enormous amount of money and to be making those investments in the UK is, is, is clearly good as well. And also we'll be given, giving patients access, albeit in a, in a very experimental manner, to the most cutting edge treatments um, that, are, that are being tested. So I think it's a good thing for us to be doing clinical studies in, in the UK. And one of the key things that we identified that had tended to stop companies doing clinical studies was simply speed <laughs> of um, starting the trial, getting approval. Very often one would have to get completely separate approvals through ethics committees at every different site that you recruited a patient. So what collaboratively has been put in place, and it's very much a, a constructive collaboration with NHS, for example, is a system where we have undertaken, and I, and I think we're the only country in the world where, um, for example, the, 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 the national healthcare provider has undertaken a quite demanding time frame to actually get get studies um, approved and up and started. started. Now, th those are relatively recent commitments, and I think we have to see whether the, indeed um, we manage to, to deliver to that. But I think that there's already signs that that, that very significant factor, which is how quickly can we get up and running and how how smoothly can we, is the process of actually getting a good assessment of what is a good study design and actually encouraging patients um, to really understand the process so they really understand what, what, they, what they are agreeing to and, and get them recruited into the studies. I think that shows up early signs of being very important. So that, that's one of the things we've focused on um, in the Innovation Board. Another area we focused on again touches on a, a very important topic that we've discussed which is access to data and electronic data and, and, a, and the unique opportunity that we have in the UK to join up NHS databases with in due course and, and it, this is an area where I think that the government have also been very proactive and um, responsive in, in looking towards um, funding the sequencing of um, quite a large number of patients. Uh, now, the cost of sequencing post the Human Genome pro Project has, has fallen dramatically. We can have the ambition of actually helping understand ge at a genetic level how certain patients differ from patients who, or from individuals who don't suffer from that disease. And in amongst that huge amount of data, there are likely to be clues around how we can better treat the next the next mechanism, the next generation of patients, and, and better target drugs to, to patients that are going to respond and avoid giving um, drugs um, to patients who are not going to respond. 